Hello and welcome to the new season of the Coaching Manual podcast hosted by me, Danny Mills. Today I'm joined by former Wimbledon, Tottenham Hotspur, Chelsea, Leeds United, Doncaster and AFC Wimbledon goalkeeper, Neil Sullivan. Neil made over 500 appearances as a professional and earned 28 caps for Scotland during his long career. He was also included in the Scotland 1998 World Cup squad in France, who opened the tournament against Brazil. Neil is now a goalkeeper coach at the Leeds United Academy. So Neil, uh, absolutely delighted um, that you've come in. Uh, let, let's take you back to beginning, um, not quite beginning of life, uh, but beginning of football. I suppose, you know, again, like every kid playing grassroots football, what, what got you into football? Um, well, I mean, all, really right at the beginning was when uh, school holidays used to go over to the park and play uh, with your mates. I had, I've got two brothers used to play in the back garden. Just football was the only thing to do, really. Younger uh, brothers, older brothers? I've got one younger, one older. So what we used to do, we'd, we'd play in the gardens, we'd go over to the park and school holidays until it got dark and, and you had to run back and so you didn't miss tea. Um, just the usual stuff kind of growing up and then as it progresses you get into playing uh, school football uh, then you get Saturday clubs and you know it's just the, the, the normal kind of route in really and, and what were you always a goalkeeper because that's, that's why I mentioned your brothers I was thinking if you've got two older brothers they probably picked on you and made you go in goal <laughs> no. but, but you're a big lad now I'm assuming you're a big lad then um, and you weren't going to get bullied by them to go in goal no no we, we just took it in turns really I used to play out on pitch I was a bit of a Midfield dynamo for one of my teams, and then uh, <laughs> and then realised running around was 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 stupid really. So I went and uh, went and stood in goal, and and uh, the teams I played for the, the the better sides I was I played in goal, so I kind of stuck with that really. And then that took you through into professional football or, or elite level. Or what or what sort of what age did you get picked up? Um, for well, that? it was different. They didn't have academies like they do now when they pick you up at under six, under seven, and, and you go through and stay at one club. It was uh, very much a uh, played Saturday football team for my local borough, which was Merton Borough. I played in goal from there. I played for uh, Sunday football for my local team, which was Oakway Sports, which was uh, another local team. And I played for uh, a pub team from Rains Park, where I grew up with on a Sunday. So that was interesting when I was kind of... 13, 14, 15, you playing to, you men's to, you football. You had to stand outside <laughs> afterwards, I take it. I weren't allowed in, yeah. I weren't allowed back in. But I played for them. That was interesting. Like playing against a load of hungover men. That was that was, that was was quite a good uh, way into football. Um, but what it was where I was playing for Merton Burrow, we, we had quite a good side. We had people like Graham Stewart was in our team. Jason Cundy was in our team. And we got to a few finals. And, and uh, they were played at Plough Lane, which was the old Wimbledon ground. Uh, and I just got spotted there as a goalkeeper. And... And from probably 14, 15, 16, I left school and went and done the YTS at Wimbledon. So quite quite late in, t- in terms of this day and age of, of yeah. getting picked up. One of the We spoke to uh, other players and stuff, and, and obviously the big thing now about is, is kids overplaying. Mm. You know, like me, you, uh, Jonathan Green that we spoke to uh, recently, there was no such thing as overplaying. No. You, you you played morning, <laughs> noon, and night. Mm. You know, and when you weren't playing with your mates, you were at home kicking the ball against the wall. Have we gone a bit too far in terms of overplaying at times? I think uh, the thing is, there's so many ways to measure overplaying now and fatigue. And you know, they have a GPS. Everyone's got a GPS. I mean, I, yeah, you know what GPS? You just went over the park, run. You got on your bike, went up to the park. Please, please, around please don't it. tell me goalkeepers have a GPS on. No, no, <laughs> thank goodness no, you're for that. Joking. No, no, I think there is a special one actually. They, they can tell how many hit, times you hit the floor and all that. But it's sometimes it can be too far. You know, when I, when you, you you were just wanting to play football, that was it. You was out in the back garden, or you was out over the park with your mates. That was it. And and at sometimes I was playing four games over a weekend. So I played for my local side, my borough side, on a Saturday morning. Then I. Um, play another game for school maybe Saturday afternoon then I'll play Saturday, Sunday morning for Oakway which was my local pub uh, club side and then I'll go and play in the pub team that's brilliant isn't it so that obviously you're, you're now 14, 15, 16 years old you're, you're at Wimbledon you go through that process and then obviously you join the crazy gang full on mm. I mean that must have been incredible experience in many ways <laughs> uh, but, but quite difficult as well I imagine it was it was tough, um, but it was brilliant at the same time. It, there was a lot going. There's always something going on there. But there was 
um, it was hard and and you you had to grow up. I think helping playing in the pub team with with a load of hungover men was was quite enlightening. And then going to Wimbledon and the crazy gang as an apprentice on the YTS it was, was no different. It was similar. <laughs> a few hangovers actually, but um, it was it it was enjoyable. You know, it, it was tough. You knew your place as a scholar, as an apprentice. Um, the jobs you had to do, the the the, the way you were treated, and, um, and was that Dave, Dave Besant was there. Dave Besson was a goalkeeper, so I was I was there um, the year they won the FA Cup in 1988. It was my second year as a scholar, so I joined as a pro that year. So 86 to 88, I was a I was not a scholar now; I was a YTS back then. Uh, and obviously, what uh, you broke into the first team quite late. Quite I had I had one game uh, when I was 21. Uh, just played one game, uh, then another one when I was 23. Which, which to put it in in context. I, I say back in the day, we're, we're actually not that old. Um, <laughs> but when you when you go back, I mean, for for young players to break in before 21, 2021 20, was quite unusual. You know, you, you had to be exceptional. You know, mm. there was, okay, yeah. I, I suppose Michael Owen, Robbie Fowler yeah. that was scoring goals. But in general, you all, it was always considered that getting into the first team was maybe 22, 23 sort of area. Yeah, pretty, yeah, pretty much, and 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 don't forget, you didn't have like an under twenty one side or an under twenty three side, which you do now, where where um, you get that progression through that, and you get a lot of games. You know, we were playing. If you weren't in the first team on a Saturday, you played in reserves on a Wednesday, and and that was made up of, you know, like senior pros who, who weren't getting a game and young kids who were coming through. So, the challenges of the gate, the reserve games you were getting were, were, I would suggest, a bit higher quality and a bit tougher because you were playing against seasoned pros. And how, how good were those goalkeepers that you worked with and how much did you learn from them as a, as a young player? You know, um, uh, Dave Besson was obviously there. Hans Sagers was there? Was that, was yeah, then there? Hans Sagers come in. And again, it, I mean, it's, it's funny saying it now, but, you know, goalkeeping coaches weren't invented back then. You, you didn't have a, a specific goalie coach, a full-time goalie coach. So you were just learning off each other and you were watching people and, uh, we had a goalie coach come in one day a week on a, on a Monday. Uh, his name was Alex Alex Walsh, and he, and he was very good. He taught me uh, the technical aspect of goalkeeping. Before then, you're just literally making it up as you go along. You you know, if a ball comes towards you, you try to catch it, and that was it. And then, you know, he came in one day so a it's week. A, it's a little bit harder than that. <laughs> it's a little bit harder, but it's it's fundamentally yeah. that's what you're trying to do. But you're trying to teach yourself it, it and then. So a lot of it was self-taught. You know, yeah, well, it had to be because, like you say. There weren't. You didn't have a, a, a full-time goalkeeping coach. And, and how did it? I mean, that that era, that sort of huge crossover when the back pass was suddenly mm. outlawed. You know, now we're talking about sweeper keepers and Edison. You know, bringing it down, chesting it down, volleying it out to to wing backs and whatever. Frightening, yeah. Uh, it, it's is it now completely different mm. to, to how it was? And is I suppose that must be the biggest change in in any position in football. Mm. The the back pass rule change goalkeeping forever yeah and, and and it took a lot to to uh to get used to i mean i there are keepers now that still aren't used to it let's be honest yeah not, well, not... It's, it's it's tough and and you know when when you used to ask about a goalkeeper you say oh can he catch a ball what size is it? now it's how good is he with his feet before they even think about whether he can save the ball and that's just the way it changed i mean i i i was at wimbledon as well where even when the back pass was brought in it wasn't You'd never play it. You just lump it as far as you could, and that there's a bit more to it than that. But you know that's the way we were. I I broke my leg through the the first season of the back pass. I got a back pass that I couldn't pick up. Obviously, I went and swung through and kicked my leg through and got straight legged, and that was it. I, I broke my leg, and that, and that was from probably the early start not being used to the back pass rule and, well, and getting used to it. And, and even as defenders, we were told don't give it to keeper. You know, yeah, don't, you know, unless it's unless he's got. Ten minutes of time, uh, and you can play the perfect ball. Because also, the, the pitches. I was back just going to say the pitches were horrendous. Were and you know, I think we all look back on old FA Cup <laughs> videos, especially that we see a lot of, and you just look at that mud pit right down the centre of the pitch. You know, the goalkeeper was mm. it was a it was a quagmire. Mm. It was just horrendous. And to deal, deal with to deal with it nowadays is much easier. To deal with what you had to deal with was almost impossible. Yeah, yeah it was tough, and and. Like you say, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't give it back to the guy. Especially me, you wouldn't get it if you did. It was one touch, and that was, that was it. But uh, that was that was tough to get used to. And like you say, some people, uh, some goalkeepers still find it hard. But the, the best ones now are phenomenal. They, you know, they're part of the team, and they can, you know, they set attacks up and 
you know, a, a fantastic at it. I, I don't want to give you cold sweats or whatever, but can't talk about Wimbledon days without talking about the Beckham goal. <laughs> I mean, because that was, I suppose it was the first time, it's the first, it wasn't the first time it had ever been tried, but it was the first time it had ever really happened. And you weren't that far off your line no, at the time. No, it was, was. Was it just completely unexpected? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, I mean, it was the end of the game. I think we were 2-0 down. At the, it was literally in the injury time and we were seeing, seeing the game out. And uh, yeah, he just, as soon as it come off his foot, you kind of go, oh, this is, this is going to be close, this. Um, but also realised I was nowhere near it anyway if it was going to go in. Um, but yeah, it was. Uh, I think being at a club like Wimbledon helped in many respects. We went in work on the Monday, and obviously I was getting slaughtered and <laughs> didn't get a great deal of press. But you know, being at Wimbledon, they just hammered me, and that was it. And it helps you get over it. That's what I mean. It's like because it we, was we, tough, we've, but it was... we've seen a lot of similar goals since uh, <clears throat> David Seaman did it. I think it was Naeem, wasn't it? Yeah. Scored yeah. Um, from even further out, mm. and, and and actually. He had more opportunity to maybe stop it um, and that sort of thing. You even had Roldinho in the World yeah. Cup with, with David yeah. Seaman. But they tend to get overlooked a little bit. Is, is it because yours was sort of like the first big goal on TV? Possibly, yeah. That, that sort of, like, and like I am now, was still highlighting it. Yeah, but it was, you, uh, and you know, in that era, it's a Premier League. It was newish and, you know, it's, it's just on its way up, really. And, and for something like that to happen at that time, with that player as well because you know he just burst onto the scene yeah. he was just on his way so you know there was a lot of things going on with that at least, goal at that, that time at least it's not as bad as a Carrius in Champions League final <laughs> yeah or Hugo well, Lloris playing in the Champions well, yeah. League final Hugo but... Lloris in a World Cup final that, it, but he, they, they got away with it didn't they but that's, and, and equally yeah. us but you'd already lost the game anyhow so yeah yeah but you know it's the life of a goalkeeper isn't it you then went on to Tottenham uh, you know a huge club at the time mm. managers you worked under George Graham Glenn Hoddle from what I know of them, I'm assuming they were complete contrasts in, in how they coached, how they dealt with players uh, and, and their mm. philosophies. Yeah, I, I actually um, really enjoy playing under George Graham because going from Wimbledon where it was, I think on on the outside seems like it was a bit raggy ass and it, it was still very disciplined in the way you had to act and perform and do your jobs and all that kind of stuff and obviously going with to Spurs with with George um, which was a massive club I, you know I'd, I'd been at Wimbledon for 13 years left school at 16 left at 29 it was you know it was a massive change for me and I, I, I really enjoyed it I like I like to be I like to know where you stood I like to know your job and like to know your role and, and I found it I, I found it really good and I was lucky enough to be player of the year that first year actually when George was here so I, I kind of flourished a bit with him and I, and I really enjoyed the time and then Glenn come on uh, and again completely different way of doing things we had a, uh, a new owner Daniel Levy had just taken over George left and it was just it was just a different way of doing things we was buying different players Teddy Sheridan come in and I mean it, it, at, even at that stage did, did Glenn ever ask you to play out from the back or was that ever or not, was, not, not necessarily with your feet but, but throw <clears throat> it out more it was coming in yeah he, he asked me to do um, drop goal kicks and kicks out your hands into certain areas and you know take a bit off it instead of just hitting an area it's more it wanted to be more um precise really which to be honest I struggled with well if, if well no, cuz I, I played with Glenn for the under 21 uh, during my time at the under 21s when he was senior manager uh, and and he, and he asked me to do something sort of similar that I wasn't particularly comfortable with I I played the sweeper role mm. um I was wasn't great on the ball, but he gave me two simple jobs: either pass it ten yards into midfield and just give <coughs> it to one of those, or ping the diagonal out to the wing mm. back or, or the winger, because I could do that. And he said, "And that's <laughs> it." He said, "That's all I want you to do." Uh, and it gets so he, yeah, he was he was trying to evolve things, but he mm. was still playing to my strengths, mm. or you know, which worked for me. Yeah, yeah, and it, it, like you say, it was that time where things were changing the back pass rule, the, the players that were coming in, there was a new way of um, just trying to change. He had, he had these definite ideas on football, you know, where he come from, the kind of player he was, um, you know, he was trying to change it. And, you know, that's what he, he tried to bring the players in at, at Spurs that, that would do that with him. Because Tottenham have always had this great philosophy of actually they play skillful mm. players, technique, Glenn Hoddle, Ozzy Ardilis. Mm. You know, people they, they, they epitomise that. Mm. Could you tell that was the philosophy at the club and some of the younger players coming through were sort of were in that mould 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, when I was or, there, or, I mean, or, we or does it does it go a bit too far, and it's maybe not as well. We we still had emotional as that players like um, Darren Andon was at the club. We had David Ginola at the club. We were fantastic players, um, but we also had players like um, Les Ferdinand, who you know you you play into his strengths. You get yeah, yeah. them balls wide and getting balls in the box. So it was a, a different way. And then when Glenn came in, he he, he brought people like Dean Richards who wanted to kind of play out from the back a bit more uh, Teddy Sheeran and Mossy he knew so I think he was trying to do it in a in a more uh, slower way to, to get his start of playing and I, I think you know people will forget you know Tottenham were a huge club at the time mm. you, did you, you played in the League Cup final yeah yeah we played against <laughs> Blackburn yeah yeah we got beat 2-1 uh, I think it was but yeah. uh, tough to take did you you know should you have won it you know Black Blackburn were I'm guessing at that time a top side. Yeah, yeah, they were a good side. Um, from the from what I remember, the game it's quite a close game. I think Andy Cole scored might have scored a, a couple of goals. Um, but we've got in the, we played in the FA Cup semi final against Arsenal as well at uh, Old Trafford, which was a another close game. So we were we were doing well, and that was under I think that was Glenn's first game actually. I think George Graham might have got us to the semi final, and then Glenn came in. That was his one of his first games. And then we progressed, like you say, the year after, got to another final. Um, but yeah, they were a good side, a lot of good players, a lot of good players in that team. So after, obviously, you've been through all, you've been through Wimbledon, Tottenham, but then probably the, the best move that you ever had must have been to Leeds. Sli- <laughs> sli- slightly biased here. <laughs> kind of, don't, don't take that so seriously. Um, but of course, you know, you, you, you came into to Leeds um, at a time when they'd been on a massive downer. Yeah. Uh, and you were competing really with, with Scott Carson, a young, a young yeah. kid. Yeah. Coming through that looked probably thirty-five at the time, um, you know, <laughs> and, and, and older it, than me. Well, it, uh, yeah, and it, it, incredible. But <laughs> you you weren't at Leeds that long, but good times there. Yeah, and also you've missed out a year at Chelsea as well. Of course, which, yeah. which you missed out after after Tottenham. Um, but yeah, I, I came up to Leeds. I think, like you say, they, they'd just gone through a tough time. Just got relegated. Um, I had to get rid of a lot of players. Um, yeah, me included. Yeah. You saw, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and that, and that to start again really and I think if if it wouldn't if it hadn't have been like that I think Scott would have played because he was an exceptional goalkeeper he was he was fantastic you know when you he was young but you go and work with him and you think yeah he's he's not bad but I think they just wanted uh, a bit more experience I think because there'd been such a, a big change we still had uh, Chief was still there so Gary Kelly was still there. Um, there was a couple but I think they just wanted a bit more experience just to Did settle you, things you, down. You get another player of the year. At Leeds, yeah, yeah, my first year I did there, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so that's, you, that's how busy I was. <laughs> well, no, but you know, I'm just, just looking through, you know, you, you've had you've had quite a few of those, you know. And I think you know, people, that's what people forget. And then, and then, when you look back at your career, and you, you know, you talk about you know Tottenham, Chelsea, massive clubs, mm. Scotland, you know, when they were good at the time, <laughs> you know, Leeds, but you know, done exceptionally well at those clubs, playoff finals, mm. disappointment of that. I mean, is that disappointing? Yeah, is that. One of the hardest games to lose. The the championship, yeah, yeah playoff final, yeah, the, yeah, horrible, horrible. Because uh, you know you spend all that season trying to get in there, and then once you're in there and you get to the final, you you it, you know it takes over your summer and you know all the expectation. And, and to be honest, the way we lost as well we, we, it was disappointing. You know, we, it's such a huge game. It, I mean, it's I, massive. I, obviously, I, I played in the ninety. 90- Eight ninety nine, ninety eight, ninety nine, ninety eight mm. final, um, and obviously Sasserelic saved the penalty. Yeah. that Mickey Gray missed <coughs> worst penalty on the planet. Yeah, but I remember Sasha it. became a hero. Mm. You know, for basically the ball hitting him. Yeah, but it changed my career. Mm. And that, I mean, the championship playoff is just incredible, isn't it? Yeah, everything it, that's wrapped around it. Again, the build up and you know the the money that's involved. Um, it would have. It would have changed Leeds' direction, I think. The, the way that the club they are now is, if we would have got up, uh, got into the Premier League with the money, and you know who knows what might we might have got relegated and come straight back down. But you know, just having that year in the Premiership would have could have changed the way or where Leeds are now. And then after Leeds, you, you moved on to Doncaster. Mm. Uh, had quite a lot, quite a long time there. Mm. In all honesty, um, again, promotions, playoffs, yeah, but a, a, a different type of club different situations compared to what you were used to because that you've been at a lot of big clubs and although Leeds were, yeah. were, were down a couple of divisions it's still a big club 
yeah. at the time. Doncaster was probably the smallest club that you paid for. Yeah, but still with big ambitions, you know. We, we were, um, I went there, things weren't working out again. New managers and new owners and different ideas. And so I just wanted to play really. That's, that's all I've wanted to do. And, and Donny came in with big ambitions and we was in League One, but got promoted and won the, the Johnson's paint. It's it's different, but the um, the ambitions are still big for a club like Donny. So if you're helping them, and to get a club like Donny into the championship and stay there um, was quite an achievement. It was similar, kind of similar to Wimbledon, really. We were a bit unfashionable. We were and how, maybe how, how, how sweet was that playoff success against Leeds? Yeah, <laughs> it, it wasn't sweet. It, no, I, no. I mean, I had a great time at Leeds. I enjoyed. It. I mean, it finished a bit strange but I'd, I'd, I'd likely I'd, I mean I'm, I'm back there now as, yeah. as I'm sure we'll touch on with the coaching there's a, there was a lot of good people then um, but I was a Donny player so but, 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 at, but at that moment it must there must have been a little bit of a I've, I've done it not written no no, uh, no not you're, against you're, Leeds you're just, no, you're just a nice no, guy no not against so Leeds I'd, I'd have been all, well mate, yeah maybe not against Leeds actually I, I had a great time at Leeds but yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's, it, it was more it was more the fact of helping it didn't matter who we were playing yeah. If you if we could have both gone up, great. But it wasn't because it is Leeds. It is that it was because it was Donny, and we'd got into the championship, which was quite an achievement, really. You're listening to the Coaching Manual podcast, hosted by me, Danny Mills. So you, you touched on it now. You've, you've now gone, well, you're still in football, not gone back into it, but you've gone back to Leeds um, as, as a coaching role. Was that always your ambition to go to go into coaching and, and, and take it take it on? Um, to be honest, I just, it, it's weird because you because I, I was playing. I, I finished at forty three years old, and I had another option for a year's playing. So I wasn't really thinking about it. You you, you know what it's like. You think you can well, you think you can play well, forever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you think you can play forever, and, and you just and when we were doing that, and I got the offer of another year, I thought, oh, I can put it off another year and, and play, but then. The opportunity come to to go into Leeds Academy uh, with Richard Naylor, who I played with. Um, and I thought, you know, it's it's time. I've I've done all I need to do, and and then you start thinking, well, what are you going to do after football? And the opportunity to go to Leeds, where I, I like I say, I enjoyed it. I knew the people in there to do coaching, which is, you know, when you leave school at sixteen and you finish at forty three, it's all you know, football. And so, and you're, you're, so you're your goalkeeper coach. Now, I'm, I'm the yeah. goalkeeper coach for the under 18s Yeah, and and how. So, so two things really. Is it easy or harder for players to go into <clears throat> coaching? Because I, I go, maybe the route you get a little bit of special treatment to get into football, but actually, are, are the expectations higher because of what you've done uh, and what people expect from you? I think there's an expectation. Yeah. Um, is is the expectation that you will be great instantly? Uh, yeah, yeah, and and it's not like that. There, there is a lot to learn. Um, Obviously, you know, I mean, the good thing, you can draw on your experiences and, and you can, you know, I, I, I coach goalkeepers, so I'd like to think I know. Just catch it. It is. <laughs> if a ball, just break it down. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's all it is. If a ball comes towards you, stop it going behind you. It's it's literally how you do it. Is, but, but, that, but, no, but, but that's quite interesting because a lot of the coaches that we've, we've spoken to and uh, or managers, coaches, whatever you want to call them this day and age, they've all said, just simplify it. Just keep it simple it, it's so it's almost got too complicated mm. in this day and age where everyone's trying to this is <clears> new this is new but actually new isn't always better or or even good at times well new isn't always new new is just something different really a I, different I, name I, yeah it's just repackaged and instead of being on a piece of paper it's packaged up onto a ipad and a nice fancy computer and shown on the wall it's it's how you get your ideas across and for me ultimately my job is it's as simple as it seems. I'm still of the opinion that a goalkeeper, first and foremost, is there to stop the ball going in the back of the net. And then everything else is obviously important with your feet and everything else like that. But I think ultimately that's what you work on. Is it hard for goalkeepers to go into management, coaching of the whole team? Are, are they still looked at in a different light because of your position when you played it is mm. so specific mm. to what you do? I can't think of many that have done it, and and again, if you if you go to any uh, training ground, there's there's the first team, and then over in the corner, there's the goalies over there. 
So you're almost a different, you're almost a different club, aren't you? With it within yeah, that club, yeah. And you know that's fine because you're the only person in that team that but, can but use you, your hands, you, and you are different. You've seen everything from where you are. You've had the same experiences. Okay, you've not technically been out of your box and playing that type of game, but you've seen it all. Mm. Does that mean goalkeepers can't be as good coach, or do they just not get the opportunity because they get pigeonholed? I think they can. I think it's it's whether they want to or not. I think. They, I mean, the first thing I found difficult from going from playing to coaching was stand on the halfway line watching a game. You know, you, you fit for... I spent years on the bench, mate. You <laughs> <get used> to... <laughs> yeah. for, well, for 28 years, I'm standing watching, yeah. and I could pick anything out from standing in go. I could see everything. I could watch everything. I could I could anticipate the run he's making, the ball he's going to play. I could see everything. And then for the first probably six months, stand on the halfway line, just looking into this crowd of players, I, I, I was just... What's going on there? I completely different it perspective. Was completely different. <clears throat> completely different. And that might have a, an impact on, on, on why. So now you've got uh, Bielsa, some label, the, the godfather of coaching. <laughs> um, you know, Guardiola and all these coaches say so how brilliant he is. How different is he? And, and, well, equally, how difficult is it to deal with him, the fact that he doesn't speak great English, I assume? Well, to be honest, with the 18s, we, we're not. Um, I don't know if you've been to Thorpe Arch recently, but the whole place is changing. It's very much a, a first team environment, so everything is based around the first team. The the, the, the changing rooms are, are different. The, where you're allowed to go. But, but will, will, it, will he expect his philosophies to drip down to the to the twenty threes, twenty ones, and eighteens? Is it, it does he has he created a club philosophy, or is he just going? No, I'm going to work on the first team and, and leave my concerns there. I think at the moment he's well, we've. I think at the moment he's very much first team. He's getting that right. I mean, obviously we, we're doing well. We've got a few players up from the academy in in to the first team, um, into the first team squad, which I think uh, are changing the way they play. But I think uh, it's very much first team. That's that's what he's concentrating on. Because let's be fair, if you're a Leeds manager, you don't <laughs> I mean it's different now. But you, well, I think you, I think as a, as a manager per se, you, you might get a year, eighteen months, two years tops. Yeah, you, you probably don't have time to put all that effort, maybe like Charlie Ferguson, Arsene Wenger, David Moyes did to actually understand every aspect mm. of the football club. Because by the time you've even gone to watch the game, you've been sacked. Yeah, yeah, and and that's the way it is. And you know, you can't blame them for that. You want, you know, if the first team's successful, at any club, you know, the club is successful and that that filters down to the academy and obviously the 23s as well you know you, you touched on obviously coaching now and, and how it's changed what's your style of coaching um or what would it you know what would it be even if you were with the outfield <clears throat> players because of you know where we hear a lot of how different managers coach and their styles and and what they want to do um in, in what way what i mean are, are you i mean extremes teacup throw a shout or whatever are you the, the silent type that just allows the players to play we've talked about a lot of in the past with on other coaches how too many coaches stop the game too often mm. you know are, are you one just actually let the players take a lot of responsibility or, or do you are you quite not domineering but pragmatic no this is what I want I think maybe a bit of everything really uh, you know you can't you can't forget where you're brought up and how you're brought up with the discipline side of it and so you try and instill that um it's very that, that's, much that's a big thing that's come through um from a lot of ex-players ex-coaches that actually the the old school principles of discipline are some of the most important factors mm. and maybe there there is a, a little bit of losing touch with those but they're again those simple things mm. of just doing the right thing at the right time being on time Turn up with your clean boots, with your clean gloves, with whatever it might be. Mm. Uh, have we drifted away a little bit from that? Yeah, we had. Uh, we we we've got a coach Billy Russell who's, who's with us, who's been around for years. Um, and after the game Saturday, he actually he actually said this, not so much Leeds, but this era or this group of under 18s has had the most that anyone else has ever had. They get picked up in the morning. They get breakfast. They get. GPS, uh, they get they've been coached since they were eight, you know all this stuff, and sometimes they don't know how to think for themselves, unless you're telling them. 
So I'm very much trying to get away from that rather than telling them what to do, what to do. Obviously, I guide them and yeah, yeah. I have my principles and I, you know, I coach how I think goalkeepers should be coached. But I don't, I don't stand there and make every decision for them. Ultimately, in those big moments, they've got to make their own decisions. But you can't stand behind the goal and go, throw it out there, do that, kick it out there, There's plenty, of, there's plenty of fans that do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You get plenty of advice from them. Certainly. But you, you've got to try and get them... And I think that's what I'm saying. They've been given so much and they've been told so much and almost, like we said earlier on, overcoached. So, so uh, advice to coaches coming through, young coaches, I'm guessing, keep the sessions simple, give them guidelines, but let them think for themselves. Mm. It's, yeah, it's important. I mean, you, you've got to have your own set plays and you've got your set patterns and how you play, but sometimes the best sessions you get is when you just sling them a ball and step back and watch them and see how they get on like going over the park with your mates you yeah. just had a ball and you used to play and you used to work it out for yourself when it's fun and it's fun and yeah. enjoyable exactly and, yeah. and, and is, is that <clears throat> sort of that last is, is that the biggest thing if sessions are fun enjoyable the session's better the players work harder so if you can make those sessions yes informative but fun and enjoyable you're going to get a lot more out of it You'll you'll learn more if you're having fun, than if if someone's just on it you on it you and you you lose concentration. But if it's fun and enjoyable, you you're bound to whether you think you are or not. You'll take more on. Perfect, brilliant. So all you coaches out there, make sure it's fun. Make sure <laughs> the kids enjoy it. That's the most important thing. So lastly, now just a few quick fire questions. Uh, can be as short as answers mm-hmm. as you like. Uh, best kit you ever played in. <laughs> Or worst, if you if you'd rather ask. Well, them. any 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 kit back in what was it the early nineties? I think goalkeepers' kits, especially, they try to get as many colours onto the top well, as they could. Gr- well, they're not all green. No, well, <laughs> we went from green to as many colours. Oh, quite some shockers. Um, I think after, well, after that certain incident that you you mentioned earlier on, I like dark colours. <laughs> so I used to wear... try and blend in. Yeah, I did, <laughs> that, that, and that's that was the thinking. I think I had a yellow top on that day, and from that then on, I always try to wear dark. Dark strip, incredible. No, has, has no relevance to how good you are as a goalkeeper, but incredible no. how the, the little psychological things get. But you, get you into do. You. you go. Did he know where I was? Because I had a yellow top on. So if I had a black top on, would he have known where I was? Would he have done that? See, if you'd been, don't know. If you'd been green, you'd have been, you'd been hidden. Exactly. <laughs> Back to the old school. See, there, there might be a few of these. Uh, bearing in mind you at the the crazy great uh, crazy game. <laughs> uh, uh, funniest thing you've seen on a training pitch that you can mention. Keeping it broadcastable. Mm. <laughs> Uh, well, you played with Ben Thatcher, so yes. you <laughs> you know uh, what he was like. Um, Wimbledon was was brilliant. Going from setting John Artson's suit alight and nearly burning the training ground down, we had to sling it out. Everyone's seen the, the TV programs of that, the, that, that'll that, do. You could you could end there. <laughs> dragging Sam a man through a massive puddle. Um, who, who was the owner? owner. Je- yeah, who was owner the owner? Chairman. I mean, um, imagine the city lads. Imagine the Man City lads doing that now that, to shake my saw. Just for the, just for the sake <laughs> of it, yeah. Just because he happened to be there, um, watching a a naked player run back to the training ground through Wimbledon Common because it's his birthday and been stripped naked. Um, <laughs> probably slightly get arrested for that. These <laughs> yeah, days. yeah, he probably would. Yeah, that was before mobile phones. You could film it. <laughs> Worst dressed teammate, um, but apart from the naked one. Uh, but Donny, we had a guy called Adam Lockwood. He wasn't he wasn't the best. Most underrated teammate that you played with? Yeah. Um I think there was a at Wimbledon we were quite underrated anyway. We had a, a, a centre half, you probably know him, Chris Perry was a centre half. Um I mean to be fair, he got a move to Spurs and, and was playing next to Sol Campbell, so maybe not got the credit, but he was horrible to play with, uh, play against, you know, all over. Not the biggest, but always on you, always nicking the ball. And we had a guy uh, just just left Wimbledon actually the the, the manager knew hardly played wide right so well you went to Wimbledon didn't you sort of right at the end of your career yeah I, I went on loan when 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 they were they were struggling and he, he just again he just needed a bit of experience really um, but he uh, wasn't quick probably had one trick and when you have people like Marcus Gow and Efna Kuku Dean Olsworth Robbie L they just wanted balls into the box and he'd, he'd either whip it in front of you if you dropped off or do his one trick and whip it in behind you was if you look at his assists I bet they're phenomenal worst game plan and what manager prepared it 
for, for, for those obviously go, Neil's, <laughs> Neil's just screwed his face up, so I'm expecting <laughs> something, either he's not going to tell me or something very interesting. Mm, well, no, well, I mean, uh, how can you... Well, we had Egil Olsen come to Wimbledon the, the year we got relegated. Um, and, and how we wanted the back four to play was was a bit a bit strange. I mean, bear in mind, most teams played two up front. He wanted a centre-half to come out of his slot and, and, and push on. I, I, even now, rethinking it, I can't I can't remember why. But all that used to happen, it, the centre half would come out, and the, the other centre forward would bend his run into the big hole that's left, and, and we and we got beat and we got relegated that year. That was that was a weird one. And the other one, Try, we were, like you said earlier, try, trying to invent new things. Yeah, when they don't I mean, need to, to be, be fair, he came, he, he came from Nor was it Norway, where he had a very successful World Cup. I think they got might have got to the semi finals or quarter finals. Um, doing it that way, but it just didn't. It just didn't work. Best trainer, uh, Frank Lampard. Brilliant. Uh, he 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 gave himself the best chance to be the best that he could be on a Saturday. He was he was class. Worst trainer. Um, well, can you can you count count if they didn't turn up? Yes. <laughs> uh, El Juf when he come to Donny. <laughs> just didn't turn up. No. Or not, not often or, enough. No, not often enough. No. Uh, best player you've played against. Hmm. See, that's that's a tricky one. Is that is that is that <clears throat> as an outfield player? That's maybe an easier question. As, as a goalkeeper, is it just the centre forward? Yeah, that well, mine would be. Yeah, I mean, my my imagine. Yeah, when you're playing against people like um, uh, Henry Burkamp, Zola, York, and Cole. But but, but, but I'm guessing that there's not. There's not too much you can do to affect them. If they're going to go past three defenders and bend it in the top corner, still makes them a good player, though. Yeah, but 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 that's not that's not your fault. There's not a lot you can do to stop them doing that. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. As, a, as a defender, it's my responsibility to stop them going past me and stop them getting a shot away. Yeah. If if they're going to stick it in the top corner as a keeper, you're sort of your finishing. You can tell you're that, isolated. Yeah, but the, the, they're finishing. But and I always I I find that a hard one. But I always say York and Cole, as a partnership, their movement and and the way they move was was. Rob, Rob, Robbie Fowler, yeah, the ball dropped to him in the yeah. box. He scored, but I'd I'd probably say I was lucky enough to play against Zidane just after they won the World Cup for Scotland, and I mean he'd done a trick on the halfway line, and the whole stadium went for it. I think he was. He's not. He's not, <laughs> not. Not bad, was he? He, he was. <laughs> he was. I mean, he, you know, he he just sit, again what looking up the pitch, and you can see his movement. See that just little silly little touches and movements, and that it was. You know, it's I think that's hard to disagree brilliant. with. Is it, is it, is it Dan the best, one of the best players of all time? It weren't time? bad, but then you're comparing with people like Henri and, yeah. and Zola and Burkham and Di Canio. I mean, it's proud proudest moment in football. I think I got. Probably the three, the, the two you touched on, the two player of the years with with uh, Tottenham and and uh, Tottenham and Leeds. You know, n- knowing the whole season's work has, has has gone, you know, rewarded. That that was very proud. And of course, the first Scotland Cup against the best team ever, Wales. <laughs> <laughs> but but you were in the squad for Brazil. <laughs> best coach you played under and why? I again we touched on it early on. I like I like George Graham. Because I like the way, again, coming from Wimbledon, where it was, you knew exactly what you were doing, you know, and it was it was great fun and it was relaxed. It's going into that discipline way of playing and and what he did and and how he wanted you to play. It kind of suited me. And and again, organisation, simplicity, discipline. discipline. Don't oh, oh, old, you know, all that kind on, of stuff. I, I, I say old um, school values, but they shouldn't be old. They sh- they should just be. Values. They're just good values, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. Uh, and last one, have you ever used your name to get in anywhere? Front, <laughs> front of a queue, restaurant? <laughs> probably. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> Why not? Uh, I'm just trying to think of one where... Yeah, jo- I, I John, Green, John Green was brilliant. said, every single time I can, the Champions <laughs> League medal comes out. I'll, I'll use it, it for anything. See, I've not got one of them, <laughs> so I can't. No, I haven't either. <laughs> Uh, that's brilliant. Uh, thanks ever so much, Neil, for no joining problem. us. Um, and good luck with coaching and, and everything else that comes from there. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to episode two of the Coaching Manual podcast. You can keep up to date with the Coaching Manual on social media. Follow us on Twitter at Coaching Manual or on Instagram and Facebook at The Coaching Manual. Go on the website, www.thecoachingmanual.com. 
register for an account now for session planning tools, high quality coaching content, and more essential resources. Thanks for listening and see you next time.